good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Amanda coventry Barrage, and I'm DWDC's program coordinator. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Kelsey Goforth and Melissa Mueller. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that while we are meeting virtually, the land dying with Dignity Canada is on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We invite and encourage that you do your own research regarding the various treaties and in particular, the land in which you're on while meeting with us today. So I am very thrilled to welcome you to another session of Focused Forum. Throughout this series, we aim to provide you with information and key takeaways, as well as create a conversation, uh, as well as create a space for conversation on end of life topics along the professionals that know it best. And before I welcome today's presenter, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Everyone on the call today is muted. However, there will be opportunities to submit questions. To do so, please type your questions into the question bar on the Zoom side panel, and we will read it out for you at the end. Please try to keep your questions as clear and as concise as possible. And while we are going to try to get to as many viewer questions as possible, unfortunately, we may not get to everyone. If you have outstanding questions following the webinar or questions that are quite personal in nature, please feel free to contact us at support at dyingwithdignity.ca and we will follow up with you individually. And finally, we will also be sending out a post webinar survey that will pop up on your screen after the webinar. It's going to give you the opportunity to share your feedback. This session is also recorded, so you will be able to watch it again later and there's no need for you to take notes if you don't need to. All right, and now to introduce today's speaker, we have Dr. Jeff Myers with us today. Uh, Dr. Myers has been a palliative medicine physician for the past 25 years and is the Bresper Family Chair in End of Life Care and Medical Assistance in Dying at the University of Toronto's Department of Family and Community Medicine within the Temerity Faculty of Medicine. Now today, Dr. Myers, or Jeff as he's preferred, uh, is a one-man army, so he's going to be running the presentation for us today. And so without further ado, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amanda. One-man army, I think that's the first time I've uh, achieved that uh, title, so that's impressive. I appreciate it. All right, you can see my slides okay? Maybe, Amanda, just let me know. Yes, your slides are presented okay. correctly. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be here uh, this afternoon with all of you. I'm in Toronto, and so it is 3 p.m. And um, I, there's a number of acknowledgements that I'd like to make um, as I begin. And the first is with uh, Helen Long and the Dying with Dignity Canada team, along with the um, World Federation of Right to Die Society's uh, Conference Committee. This presentation was originally supposed to be given a few weeks ago. Uh, during the as a keynote during the conference and unfortunately uh, the night before I had a uh, horrible horrible allergic reaction to something that I ate and ended up in emergency and uh, was unable to uh, to make the the conference which was just horrifying to me to uh, to have cancelled last minute so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to actually uh, speak with you uh, this afternoon and, uh, and and give this presentation, um, which I'm I'm grateful to have been uh, invited to give in the first place. I'd like to acknowledge um, Bunny and David Bresver, who, as you can see at the bottom right of the slide, um, I am the Bresver Family Chair in End of Life Care and Medical Assistance in Dying at the University of Toronto. And it really is through um, the Bunny and David's generosity and vision and foresight that has given me over this past year and in the, uh, the next few years a real platform to really truly try and uh, make, make an impact around um, end of life communication as it relates to um, to dying in general and, and medical and assisted dying overall. So a thank you to 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 Bunny and David um, for for again for their generosity. I'd like to acknowledge my clinical and academic colleagues at Bridgepoint Hospital and uh, the Department of Family and Community Medicine, from whom I uh, endlessly learn about um, so many aspects of, of, of care and of academics, and as well my uh, KMAC, KMAP colleagues, KMAP standing for the Canadian Association of uh, MAID Assessors and Providers, uh, belong to uh, the um, support sort of uh, group 
blog and I've learned um, a ton about um, about MAID, about uh, collegiality um, from participating and reading through these um, the uh, the conversations that are occurring. And I'd mostly like to thank and acknowledge the people and their families whose stories I'll be sharing um, parts of today uh, during the presentation. And they really are uh, etched in my brain, these stories from, from over the years. And so I'd, I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the, the wonderful gifts that each of them have given me um, that I can share with you. So just a little bit about who I am, Amanda, Amanda sort of covered the, 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 the highlights I have been, uh, which sort of astonishes me, but I have been at this for 25 years now. Um, I'll get into some of the details of how um, sort of my career has evolved over time, but I've been very, very um, uh, lucky to have worked in, in all care settings where palliative care is practiced. And it's been, my career sort of spanned a time when, when the evolution of palliative care as a field has been really quite rapid and uh, tremendous, it's experienced tremendous growth. And um, there was a real um, small, uh, a real dearth of, of leadership um, in, in palliative care, both clinically and academically um, over the last 25 years. So I've also sort of evolved in my career at a time when there was a great need for palliative care leadership, which has given me the opportunity to um, experience uh, leadership at provincial, national and, and international levels. And, and as Amanda mentioned, and I've uh, mentioned as well as the, you know, the Bresdor family chair over the last couple of years, this has given me a, a particular insight into today's topic, um, most certainly, but it, um, it's also given me the, the space to actually really think um, critically about, um, about how we move forward as a society um, when we've got the kinds of challenges that, that currently Canada is facing and, uh, and that many countries around the world are actually facing as they are introducing and implementing um, assisted dying legislation. So when I sat down a couple of months ago, um, after I was invited to give the presentation um, by Helen, and I really thought, you know, what is the, think Jeff about this relationship, I, I've been a palliative care clinician for 25 years, for the past five years, I have been a maid assessor and provider. And, and, you know, I really sort of thought about the current relationship. And I wondered, came up with this, this sort of set of, of of possibilities i wondered if the current sort of state of the relationship is is sort of the dispassionate pragmatic result of what are likely fundamental and irreconcilable differences in the value that's most highly prioritized or is it the victim of a series of semantic differences and this was the you know i was quite proud of myself that i had come up with this rather um I would say cerebral and intelligent and perhaps even academic sounding set of questions. And so the one disclosure that I have uh, to share with all of you today is that despite all of this, the 25 years of, uh, of experience, the ins and outs of, uh, of academia and clinical leadership, and, and now this person of her family chair, really what I've come to is that it's just really, really complicated, this relationship. And, and that's kind of the, the take home message is that, and I'm, I'm not trying to make light of it at all, because I, I fully appreciate the, the depths of the challenges. Um, but it, it is really, really complicated. And so to sort of add to my humility in, in all of this, um, you know, I went, had this sort of, you know, this framework in my mind as I was approaching preparing and last night as I was putting kind of my final um, thoughts together, I came across this, this study which was published a couple of years ago um, by colleagues from Calgary, and the title of it uh, is palliative sedation and made but distinctly different or simply semantic so I actually can't even take credit for <laughs> the foundational work that uh, uh, the framework from which I, I approached this. And so, you, you know, it sort of left me a bit stymied as to how I was going to approach this topic in a really meaningful way. And so I went back to my original notes when I was uh, considering applying for the Bresler family chair. And at the time, uh, what I had done was I met with um, palliative care colleagues from across the country. I had about 20 meetings actually with folks who over the years I've really come to respect as colleagues, because it was really quite important to me that I um, that I um, 
that they understand sort of why I was pursuing this role, what I saw as the opportunities. And what I learned was, and what I, I came to understand and appreciate was the extent of the impact um, that the relationship between palliative care and assisted dying, the, the impact of that relationship has had on many people across Canada. And, and to the extent that, that you know, when I interviewed for the role, I, I positioned an opportunity to really hold a space for dialogue and, and, and begin to kind of address the moral injuries that have resulted from the, the ways that, um, you know, we've, the approaches that we've taken, the ways that we've interacted, the consequences of not um, being really um, as thoughtful, I think, as we, we maybe could have been, um, in as it relates to the specific relationship. So, you know, part of my vision for this Bresver Family Chair is to hold space for this for this dialogue. And, and the, really the only way that you can um, begin to address conflict is to, you know, appreciate others' perspectives. And so for today, what I've decided to do is, is, is really do a deep dive on what palliative care is and use my, my story uh, and share aspects of my story with you um, to kind of describe what palliative care is. And, and really it's it, through the lens of the elements that currently Canada is facing in late uh, 2022, as far as the implementation of assisted dying. So for anyone who might be from a different country that is considering or recently passed assisted dying legislation, and you're thinking about implementation, what I hope is, is that my story might spark you to consider your palliative care colleagues a little bit um, differently. Um, the state of palliative care itself across the country is so highly variable, but being thoughtful um, about the relationship can only benefit your jurisdiction. The other thing before I before I get into the the sort of the meat of the presentation is that today I'm wearing my palliative care hat because I see my task um, I, this afternoon is to really challenge you and to raise difficult questions in a way that you can receive them. So, so although I'm, I am um, a made assessment provider today, in, because I'm speaking to what I imagine is largely a, um, a made supportive audience, I'm wearing my hat of a palliative care clinician because I really want you to appreciate um, that perspective. So if I think about how my career has evolved, um, it's really reflected by the aim and the direction of the advocacy efforts and how these have evolved over time. So initially advocacy, advocacy efforts were really to be a thing. Um, the next kind of focus for advocacy for me was to be relevant, then sort of evolved to be worthy and I aimed to be respected uh, in terms of my advocacy efforts. So what do I mean by all of this? What I'll do is, is kind of take you back to 1997 um, and, and talk more about what I mean when I say advocacy to be a thing, because at the time I had finished my family medicine training at here at the University of Toronto, and um, there weren't uh, formal experiences, educational experiences around palliative care. I had been drawn to the field because of what I had witnessed with friends um, and their experiences around HIV and AIDS and their, their end of life experiences around HIV and AIDS. And I knew that we could do better. And, uh, and so it was to me sort of not an option. It was the only thing that made sense to me for, right from day one was, was a palliative care career. And it was initially a focus on, uh, on HIV and AIDS. And what that did was bring me to somewhat unexpectedly uh, Los Angeles for 10 years. So the first 10 years of my career, um, I, I plopped myself down at the age of 25 in the middle of Los Angeles and <laughs> immediately got a therapist because that was a bit too much for me to kind of process at the time. But where I worked clinically was initially at uh, what's pictured here is Carl Bean House, um, which was an HIV AIDS hospice which eventually after five years, it did close down um, because of the, the changing nature of HIV and AIDS at the time. And so I really shifted my focus then um, for the last five years of my time in Los Angeles and I ran Cedar sinais home uh, hospice program. And I would say that this 10 years was, was uh, so foundational for me and I really learned what it meant to be person-centered, what palliative care is, what being a clinician actually means, 
and I really attribute this to to, to nurses like uh, Miss Willie, who I will never forget, um, as a um, uh, she um, a strong strong advocate. I think is is an understatement. Where I learned really to to um, be a good doctor was through the two social workers that I worked with in over the years, uh, Sarah and the the luminous Stephanie and right to whom I'm endlessly grateful for having taught me so so much, and and really you know, it was about being in people's homes. What I learned from them is, is how to be in people's homes. And I want to share with you just three brief stories of, of some people whose homes that I visited um, during my time in Los Angeles. And the first uh, woman was named Tara, and she was 54 years old, and she had just been diagnosed with locally advanced cervical cancer. And she was referred to uh, Cedar Sinai's home hospice uh, because she was quite worried about pain management. And when I went to visit her, she was a very, very wealthy woman. And she was somewhat irritated by my visit because she was preparing all of her artwork she, to be distributed. She had made the decision to travel to Switzerland and to end her life uh, using the, the um, program, the assisted dying program that's available in Switzerland. And so, you know, I, it was a very brief visit. It was only about 15 minutes, but it, it made such an indelible mark on me because this, this person, with, although her disease was not curable, it certainly was not, um, uh, she would not die in the next year or two. Um, but she was she was very very certain about her decision, and 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 off to Switzerland she went several weeks later and died. The second person I want to talk to you about is and share with you a story about his name is Alfred, and he was a seventy nine year old gentleman who had kidney cancer that had spread throughout his body. He also had Parkinson's disease, and um, his greatest he was a lawyer, and his greatest love in life was to read the Harvard <clears throat> Law Review. And when he got to the point that he could no longer read it, and for him, he needed to be able to turn the page himself. Um, when he got to that point, he uh, had also made a decision to travel to Switzerland. And I remember um, when he first shared that with me, as I was leaving his house, his daughter stopped me at the, at the door and she said, I'm really struggling with um, arranging things for Switzerland because he's still making choices um, to stay alive. And I said to her, I said to her, what do you mean? And she said, well, he's still eating and drinking. And it really hadn't occurred to me that that was something that was a, a choice that a person was making um, to actually remain alive. And I know <clears throat> for probably most of the people um, here today that it might just seem sort of obvious, but to me at the time, um, being very early in my career, that was sort of astounding to me. And so I asked the daughter if we could go and share that with with Alfred and 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 she said absolutely. So we went upstairs back upstairs and and uh and and shared with him, you know, that that in in actuality he was making this 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 decision and what were his thoughts on that. And his entire expression changed and he just became elated and he referred to the moment as the liberation because he stopped eating and drinking right then and there and he died eight days later, uh, really quite comfortably. And, and as I was flipping through, you know, the news a couple of uh, months ago, and I saw um, that Ukraine had liberated um, Kershaw, I, I, and, and there was this picture, I, I put it up there as, as a reminder of the, the power of uh, that word liberation and how Alfred had used it. And the third person I want to share with you just a brief story is her name is Haley. And she had the most horrific nausea of any patient that I recall, actually, in, in 25 years. She had ovarian cancer and a malignant bowel obstruction. And her um, nausea was relentless and it was profound. And, you know, there were so many different things that had been tried and that were that was not effective. We actually ended up using a medication called Haldol and put it in a cream form so that she didn't have to have anything in her mouth. And that helped for about a week or so. And what that helps her realize is, is that she really was um, uh, suffering uh, intolerably. And so we began for, for, for Haley um, palliative sedation. And for anyone who doesn't know what palliative sedation is, it's sort of the symptom management strategy when all else fails. And so it is managing the symptom by sedating a person so they're no longer experiencing the person, uh, the symptom. And, and uh, you know, typically it's, it's uh, a person is near the end of life. And so um, Haley died about 
16 days later, um, the ethical principle that at the time sort of guided this was that the primary intention was to manage the symptom, not to um, hasten her death. And so that has always been a tool in, in a palliative care um, basket to, to a symptom management tool in our, in our basket. And so it just, these are three stories that are connected to this larger theme that, that we'll be talking about that I wanted to, to share with you. So coming back to the, the primary question, which is what is palliative care? You know, in 1997, um, I was, as I mentioned, I was doing home visits. And really when you're, when you are um, in the home decision, you're, you're sort of it as the physician, you're the most responsible physician, you are the, the facilitator of, of decisions. But but when you're making home visits, typically there's decisions that have been made. You know, for someone to sign up to a home hospice program, they would have to have had some conversations about end of life. So by definition, the, the um, home setting um, is not as challenging from a decision-making perspective. Um, the other uh, sort of location in the community where palliative care is practiced is the long-term care um, setting and I would say that that what the pandemic has really showed us is that the long-term care sector really does need support um, and uh, and I have very limited experience in the long-term care sector but I did want to point out that that's an important care setting for us to be considering palliative care. So if I fast forward to 2006 and it was time to come back to Canada I had finished a master's degree at uh, at USC in in medical education, and I was wanting to uh, shift into a, an academic focus. and And so, the really the, the I had we had I had moved from being to you know to advocacy around being a thing and advocacy on being relevant to really a sense of worthiness. And, and I uh, began work at Sunnybrook Hospital here in Toronto. And uh, at the time we had an outpatient clinic in the cancer center. And so it was a very different palliative care population. It was an ambulatory population. It was folks that are on active treatment for, uh, for their cancer. Um, they tended to have quite high uh, symptom needs. Um, and the, set, the clinic that we had was set, embedded within the oncology clinic. And so I worked alongside um, my oncology colleagues uh, for many years. The attention on palliative care was starting to grow uh, in 2006. And um, uh, because of the relationship with cancer, I would say, we, we palliative care um, became a lot more um, within sort of medical specialties became relevant, I would say, because of, of the relationship with cancer. I was also in a leadership role at, with Sunnybrook. And so we had moved from sort of two half day clinics a week to 10 half day clinics a week, um, which was a really uh, wonderful um, measure of, of our, express, our, our success and, um, and sort of the success in, in both the care, but also in our advocacy. What was interesting to me as I reflect on that time though, is that at least once a week, I had to field a request and have a lengthy conversation with whomever fielded this request to change the name of our clinic from the palliative care clinic. Um, and so I, I actually came across a couple of, of articles. The first, um, which was a survey that was published in 2009 by the group from MD Anderson, my palliative care colleagues from MD Anderson, who surveyed oncologists um, and asked really, you know, would you be more likely to refer to um, a clinic that was named supportive care versus palliative care? They did a subsequent study. Um, they did change the name from palliative care clinic to supportive care clinic. And they showed that there was a 40% increase in, in between 2009 and 2011 in the number of referrals. And I went back to our data um, around that exact same time. And we actually had uh, almost an 80% increase in, in, uh, in our clinical volumes over that same period of time. We did not change the name of, of our clinic. We kept it at palliative care. Um, this idea of rebranding palliative care, however, persists. And this just being um, a, a, an editorial published by the BMJ a couple of years ago. And, and I just want to you know, point out that each time it, it, was, it was a little blow, right? You know, I had 
it was at least once a week and it was over 10 years. So I had 520 conversations with oncologists and neurologists, cardiologists around why changing the name is not the answer. And, you know, I heard some pretty frustrating uh, comments about what palliative care is and, and a lot of misperceptions. And if, if this is sort of what my colleagues were saying to me, I couldn't imagine the messaging that was being received by patients and families about what palliative care actually is. And so it was tricky to see how we were going to move into advocacy around um, being respected until 2010, when um, sort of the most, I would say, the most um, practice changing and profession changing uh, study was published. And I want to walk you through the study because it's actually quite important to the to the history of palliative care. It's a study by Jennifer Temmel and uh, the group in Boston that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. And it was a study of lung patients, uh, lung cancer patients. And I want to walk you through what they actually did with this population. So at the time of diagnosis, um, they had patients who had advanced incurable lung cancer um, from the moment they were diagnosed. Average lifespan for this population is about nine months. They tend to be highly symptomatic, and so a great number of palliative care-related needs. And they randomized um, the individuals, the cancer patients, into two populations. The first the received the current care, the standard oncology care, which may have included a, a referral to the palliative care team. And then the, the treatment arm or the, the study arm received an automatic referral to the palliative care clinic. And uh, patients were then, so at the time of diagnosis without um, kind of the referral from oncology, but just routine um, palliative care assessment. Patients were seen on average two to three times in clinic. Um, and they followed these patients until, until they died. And they looked at, you know, what were the differences in outcomes between these two populations, those that may have received palliative care, but the standard oncology care, and those who, who received palliative care from the time of diagnosis. And what they found was the, the folks that were referred to palliative care um, had a much greater understanding of their illness than those that, uh, that were in standard care, had less uh, intravenous chemotherapy in the last 60 days of their life, they had a better quality of life, less anxiety and depression. And to the surprise of many, uh, not to the surprise of palliative care clinicians, but to the surprise of the oncology world, the patients from who were referred to palliative care at the time of diagnosis lived longer. And the actual, the survival benefit that uh, palliative care afforded was actually greater than Tarceva, which at the time was a, a chemotherapy agent that had just been, was the new fancy chemotherapy agent, um, agent that was um, being given to people with advanced lung cancer. So people lived longer um, who had palliative care from the time of diagnosis. That was um, quite foundation shaped shaking to the oncology world. But for those of us in palliative care, it came as no surprise. Um, when you manage people's pain, when you manage their um, anxiety, when you manage their shortness of breath, when you address them as a person, when you ensure that um, uh, it, their existential uh, needs are met, their spiritual needs are met, um, people can relax into their life and, and end up living longer. And this was followed by many, many, many studies that confirmed um, evidence for the impact of palliative care around symptoms, around quality of life, around caregiver distress and trauma, um, around resources that are used, um, hospitalizations, um, preferences for care setting, and of course, cost. So there's study after study in the, in the mid uh, 2010s, and yet, Despite all of this evidence, there were three, and I and I can still vividly recall them, three oncology colleagues who would not look me in the eye. And 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 really it was it it took me quite some time to figure it out, but I represented their failure. And so they would not, whenever we would speak, uh, they would look down on the floor uh, if they were, if they found themselves, you know, able to sort of converse with me. And, and they could not um, look me in the eye. It was to the point where my last uh, couple of weeks at Sunnybrook before I, I, I moved on to my next role, <laughs> for all three of them, I actually got down on the ground when I was talking to them to see and, and looked up at them and said, where are you looking? Um, and, 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 and yet still, you know, representing their failure. I was trying to 
to maybe add a bit of levity to the this presentation and, and I thought I wonder what the right emojis for for this sort of circumstance um, is but and this is sort of what I came up with but but despite all of the evidence, despite the impact, um, the struggle to be respected um, was maintained. So coming back to sort of our, our settings um, and, and what is palliative care, it, it kind of takes us to, to 2015. And the other um, setting at Sunnybrook where our, our team was involved was in the acute care setting. And I want to tell you about palliative care and acute care, um, because it's quite similar in some ways to the clinic in that, um, you know, the reason why uh, my colleagues were asking to change the name is because they had difficulty and, and great discomfort with explaining, having to explain what palliative care is. Uh, the acute care setting is chaotic. It is, uh, it's busy. It's, it's, there's really no time for people to ingest information. I became I became used to walking into a hospital room and figuring out very quickly whether I needed to hide my name tag that identified me as a palliative care physician. I had gotten used to apologizing really quite profusely to patients who had been told that they were being uh, referred to pain clinic and not palliative care clinic and were horrified when they were found out that it was palliative care clinic. Most of the people that we saw in clinic and in the hospital were alive for many months, years. And for almost all, um, their final destination was entirely unclear. Um, for almost all, the idea of having a final destination was offensive or repellent um, or unconsidered, really. So most of my day was spent battling the perception of palliative care, that palliative care means a person is dying. Um, and, and, and doing what I needed to do to make sure that I could provide good care. And if that meant hiding my name tag, then so be it. But that's just what we did um, at the time. In the clinic in the hospital setting, there's some stories that I, that I want to pick up from this point and kind of share with you um, that, uh, that sort of parallel kind of the stories of, of, of what was going on in Los Angeles for me in the years before. And there was a young man named Matt who had um, a pancreatic tumor that, that secreted insulin or an insulin noma. Um, and when, um, for, if there are non-clinicians that are, uh, that are, are watching this, when you, when you have a tumor that's growing in size and it's, it's producing insulin, you know, you become, you have low blood sugars, um, quite quickly and quite profoundly. And the discomfort from that is, is, um, exceptional. I've only seen it once. And so, you know, despite, um, IV fluids that had just massive concentrations of sugar because he was producing so much insulin from his cancer. He was in this perpetual state of low blood sugar and was horrifically uncomfortable with it. And Matt is someone who we needed to um, proceed with palliative sedation. And I want to tell you the story about uh, Perry, who um, it's a it's a it's a difficult story to share, but I want to be honest about some of the challenges of dying. Um, Perry had a head and neck cancer. And when there are head and neck cancers, there's a great risk of as as tumors sort of grow of uh, the tumor cells eroding into uh, one of the major blood vessels in your neck. And Perry's uh, tumor was at risk for eroding into his carotid artery. And one day uh, while he was in the hospital, that actually happened. For those of you that um, or have any sort of end of life experience, you know that with people who have a head and neck cancer, we tend to um, counsel to have dark towels around in case there is a major bleed. And, and, and the reason for the dark towels is so that the patient and the family don't have that visual of blood being, being everywhere. And, and Perry's um, cancer did erode into his carotid, carotid arteries. And he died about 15, 20 minutes later. Um, there was about 10 of us in the room um, desperately trying to, to uh, manage his um, discomfort by sedating him. And, and it's fair to say that, that uh, there weren't enough dark towels in the world to address the, the visual you know, of, of what we had witnessed. 
and so there are times that uh, that dying can be really, really horrifying and horrific. The other piece of the puzzle that I wanted to to sort of share with is that in in you know over the years, what I developed was a skill set around responding to desire to die statements. When people would make any sort of statement around a desire to die that seemed to be an immediate referral to palliative care for help. Um, and so there's a whole body of research uh, around how to respond to desire to die statements and whether or not they might reflect depression and hopelessness or an actual desire for death to be hastened. So, you know, there's sort of these guidelines. So, you know, as of 2015, then I had had, you know, at this point, sort of 18 years of experiences where I've told you a couple of really, you know, the this the palliative sedation stories that stand out in my mind, I can only remember a few of them and they're memorable. And I share the story about Perry and his carotid because it stands out to me, despite thousands, probably thousands of people whose deaths I've been a part of. So for me, so few deaths in 2015 had been what I would consider to be undignified. And I had developed a skill set, a skill set to sort through a desire to die. So, you know, this is kind of what I was going through my mind and what was my reality in 2015. And then medical assistance and dying came along. And this will sound naive and perhaps even concerning to, to some of you. But for the first little while, I honest to goodness did not know what problem medical assistance and dying was going to solve. You know, as I say, to me, there had been so few undignified deaths. There had been so such a small need for um, the, the suffering from intractable suffering from requiring palliative sedation was so uncommon that I really wasn't sure what problem medical assistance was going to be done, was going to solve. I've been asked many times over the last couple of years why my palliative care colleagues feel strongly um, about MAID. And I do need to come back to, it's really, really complicated, but I wanna share with you an experience um, that I had that on some level, smaller or bigger, is a version of which likely occurred for, for all of my palliative care colleagues across Canada anyways. So at the time in 2016, I had really, um, uh, you know, been, uh, had, pursued different leadership pursuits, um, leadership opportunities. And the the most recent one was with the Ontario Palliative Care Network, which was the provincial um, uh, standard setting organization. It was new, it was just being established in 2015-16. And I was, uh, along with my colleagues, Denise Marshall and Jose Pereira, I was in an acting provincial clinical lead role, which for me was really exciting. And I was, um, prepared and ready to to apply to the permanent role and take over from Denise and Jose. And, you know, we had, why this was so significant is that we had a direct sort of relationship with the Ministry of Health. And, um, and so, you know, to, to have, to, to learn this language that of policy to be in a position of being able to influence, um, it was really exciting for me. And, you know, I had my my urgent clinical issues uh, in Ontario, the four ones that needed to make change, we needed to make change around. And I also had sort of this, we developed this framework of, of, of provincial clinical standards and the 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 work in each of these domains that uh, that would help, you know, palliative care move forward in Ontario. Um, quite proudly, uh, all of these things. And and my first sort of, um, you know, what I wondered actually is, is could I actually get beyond, could we get beyond um, advocacy for being respected and actually achieve uh, being needed? Imagine, uh, you know, this field that I've come to, to, to identify so strongly with, could we actually be needed? And so, you know, my first um, interaction alone with the Ministry of Health person was um, the request by the individuals who were responsible for implementing MATE. And uh, so her counterparts within the Ministry of, of Health. And so just to kind of paint a picture for you, 
the person who had been, um, you know, palliative care was in her portfolio from the Ministry of Health. She had been given sort of half a day every two weeks um, for palliative care. There were, she had a number of different um, areas within her portfolio. And so this is how much time had been dedicated to palliative care. And we showed up for the meeting uh, to talk about um, made implementation. And there were 36 people in the room. Uh, besides the two of us, 36 full-time Ministry of Health employees um, who were um, hired to and, and positions were to implement MAID. And, and so just, I mean, just some numbers around this, it, that meant that, that the person had 104 hours of year, a, a year um, for palliative care. And there was three times that amount um, that could be delivered in a week um, for, for MAID. And to me, this was um, a massive, massive um, defeat in terms of my, my kind of career and ambition. All of these the very colorful uh, provincial clinical standards, these four issues, all of that work to me at that moment, I realized that it probably wouldn't go anywhere because there just simply wasn't the resources to be able to move things like that forward. And so I did not pursue the permanent uh, provincial lead role. Um, it was it was a challenging time for me because the changes that I that I could make to the palliative care system just couldn't happen. Um, and I wondered if in my lifetime there there would come a time when palliative care wouldn't need to capitalize on something else to be respected and even needed. And so I come back to these two emojis, um, which somehow seemed fitting for this moment. There's one setting that I haven't yet talked about, which was the setting that I moved to um, after I uh, made sort of this kind of life review, and that was to the inpatient palliative care unit. And in the inpatient palliative care unit, much similar to the home setting, you are the most responsible physician. You are the, the person that uh, where the buck stops. And I'll tell you about a story um, uh, about a patient named Henny, who I met shortly after I arrived at uh, the palliative care unit. She was a woman with uh, who was 72 and had recently retired and was on a trip across the U.S. with her husband when she started having difficulty finding words. And she was diagnosed with a, a glioblastoma. And she was had you know multiple rounds of, of treatment and was admitted to our palliative care unit. And at the time she was admitted, Henny could still speak a few phrases, and um, she had a little uh, some struggling with with the right words. Um, but she was cognitively a hundred percent. But over time, that um, her her abilities declined. She was able to to say yes or no, and then she lost that. She was able to give thumbs up and thumbs down, um, and and. She was it, the part of the tumor that was affecting her brain was the, in the expressive part of her brain. And so she would often go like this, and then you could see her go like that because she actually meant no, but started out with a yes. And this was um, just an unbelievable source of suffering for her. And she requested uh, made. And this was my first request. I had not had a patient who had even raised MAID or, or made any sort of request before. And so we went through the the um, you know the process at the time. It was actually, she hadn't wanted to set a date right away. So it ended up being about three weeks. And, and so for that entire time, I hadn't heard uh, any speak and I really didn't know how I was gonna feel about, um, about the procedure, but I knew that um, that I was the one that needed to to be in the room and to to push the medications. And I walked in the room the morning of her procedure, and I said to her, "Henny, how are you today?" And she said, "I've never been happier." And that was all I needed. That was all I needed to know that uh, in that moment, I was alleviating this person's suffering. She also, uh, one of the nurses, had come in with a big. Uh, Thing of Tim Horton's coffee, and I had never rolled up the the lid before, and because I was always worried I was going to spill it everywhere. And Henny looked at me and she said, "Roll it." So I had to roll this <laughs> this Tim Horton's cup, and I did win uh, a free coffee and a, and a muffin for for folks to know. But her the because she was able to, she was feeling so freed. Um, she was actually able to speak. That was all I needed to, to to understand what made was, and to understand that I had a role in providing this care to people. So apologies for getting emotional, but it really was quite profound. 
So I get it. I get, I, I get why assisted dying is a thing. And, and what I'm left with is things that I don't know. I don't know how some of my colleagues in organizations reconcile with not, um, not providing this care to their patients. Um, I, I actually don't know how, um, how I, if I could work at a place where I would need to transfer somebody or I would need to refer to a made team, I personally just don't know how, how that happens. I also don't know how to reconcile the massive increase in palliative sedation that I've seen over the last um, couple of years, where it is often positioned as an alternative to assisted dying. I don't know how to reconcile that. I also don't know if and how to reconcile, um, you know, assisted dying for really especially challenging populations, which is what Canada is currently sort of um, uh, facing right now. But I do have a couple of worries that I want to share with you in detail. The first uh, worry that I have has to do with uh, ongoing uh, misconceptions, and I have an example around that. And then um, a worry that I have about advanced directives. So. As part of the introduction of the, the legislation in Canada, there was a mandatory um, parliamentary review. And over the last several months, there's been uh, the joint committee in, um, in at Parliament, which is uh, comprised of both elected officials and uh, Senate officials who are appointed to their positions. Um, and I've, I've watched the 80, 90 hours of testimony that has been um, presented by witnesses from across the country on many aspects of, of, of assisted dying. And I dutifully watched every single hours and I paid really close attention. And two things um, for this group in this presentation that really struck me is that most um, were coming from the assumption that at baseline dying is a terrible uh, thing and that the dying process itself is undignified, um, fraught with sort of needless suffering. That was the baseline. That was what I was interpreting as the baseline sort of acceptance as to what dying actually is. And I don't think that it is that. And so I really would caution us to, to be, be ensure that we're, we're using language that, that, that doesn't sort of categorize every dying experience as as um as wrought with fraught with a needless suffering the other thing that i think is important is that for witnesses that were in support of whichever topic the questions weren't political they were thoughtful they were um i found them to be really um quite um helpful in general for witnesses that weren't in support of the topic, I felt that there was a, a there was a difference um, in the tone of the questions, and and it did make me concerned for my palliative care colleagues, who who were who were witnesses and how the kinds of questions that they found themselves um, fielding. I felt that they were different, so I just want to point that out. The other thing that I that I want to um, what worries me is around uh, the current waiver and advanced directives, and so let me explain this. So in the current sort of uh, legislation in Canada, the there is now a um, an ability to um, sign a waiver that would mean a person doesn't have to have capacity at the time that the procedure takes place. And what's required is for the person and the physician or nurse practitioner who's going to be doing the procedure is to come to an agreement um, that, you know, if on this date that we have scheduled our the made procedure, if I've lost capacity, that I'm giving you consent, doctor or nurse practitioner, to, to still proceed with the procedure. And what's really important in that statement is that it's between the nurse practitioner or the medical practitioner and that it's on a specified day, right? So a date has been set and, and to allay sort of people's worry if they, that if they happen to lose capacity, the procedure can, can proceed. The last time that I was on service in the palliative care unit, I had three patients, admitted three patients who arrived to, you know, with a, a completed waiver and, and in the, the date, it was some version of, of, of some time in the future, just sort of this vague January 2024 as an example. And so there's, there was a misuse of this, of this waiver. And I want to park this just for a minute because I want to come to um, the evidence around advanced care planning. 
right? And what this relates to is the the population that we're talking about in Canada now around advanced requests for for MAID, where a person um, many years um, before they, or many many years or months or whatever period of time before they would have the procedure, um, completes an advanced request so that you know when certain conditions are met that the that the person could receive assisted dying. So. I want to come to the to advanced care planning literature because I think this is really important. And in October of 2021, um, very, very highly respected colleagues uh, from the states, palliative care colleagues in the states, um, wrote this very controversial um, article in JAMA that that really outlined all of the problems with advanced care planning. And they went so far as to encourage that that funding really be um, uh, and resources be allocated uh, towards um, things that we actually have data and evidence for. And one of the things, one of the challenges with this particular piece was that the equated or the definition of advanced care planning was advanced directives. And what an advanced directive is, is um, it's a uh, you know, documentation of preferences regarding future potential Medicare medical care decisions. So, for example, an advanced directive would be, you know, someone completing, you know, these questions. Yes, I want uh, CPR. Yes, I, I, I want uh, nutrition and fluids. Yes, I want dialysis long in advance of a clinical context when they would actually um, be offered these. And what my colleagues in the States were, were commenting on is that despite 25 years of research on advanced directives, what we've learned is that these advanced, direct advanced directives do not improve or impact end of life care. They don't improve decision making and they don't improve the quality of life. So I was actually one of the three, lucky to be one of the three individual uh, groups who um, had their their reply to this uh, viewpoint, this editorial published. And, and our point in, in, in our reply was essentially don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's aspects of advanced care planning um, that have evolved beyond advanced directives and that we really need to, to uh, actually focus on these aspects, the, the positive aspects the, for which there is some evidence of their benefit. But what I want is really important for this conversation is that they were right about the, the problematic nature of advanced directives. And it's widely accepted that, that, that um, surrogate decision makers are just not able to make decisions in, in, um, you know, with information from an advanced directives. And, you know, what I, I, I fully understand that advanced requests for the context of assisted dying, what that is, is again, an, a, an interaction between the, the physician or the nurse practitioner and the patient and coming to an agreement as to what that would look like and what are the conditions, the specific conditions that a person would need to be in in order to proceed with an assisted dying. But my worry is is, is that um, uh, what we know from advanced directives in general is, is that they are not effective. And I wonder if there is something that we can learn from um, other jurisdictions around advanced uh, requests. I don't know what the answer is to advanced requests. I appreciate why people are needing them, but on the receiving end of, of, of poorly completed waivers, I worry that, um, that it's a sign that we're going to have poorly, um, poorly completed advanced requests as well. So it's, it's one of the two things that I worry about. So my last couple of moments here, I just, I, you know, this idea of, of what can we learn from other jurisdictions, a note about Belgium, which is often sort of quoted as, um, you know, one of the countries that has had assisted dying legislation for, for quite some time. And what I think is really important about Belgium and what differs about Belgium is that palliative care clinicians were actually involved with the initial crafting of the legislation back in 2001, 2002 in Belgium. Um, and at the same time that that legislation went through, palliative care became accessible to every um, person in Belgium. And, and those are some key differences that, um, that have made for a, a very different relationship to have evolved uh, in Belgium over time. And so if we, if we think about what we can learn from other jurisdictions, um, you know, it would be um, figuring out, as far as I'm concerned, how palliative care might be involved um, with the with the legislation, if that's possible. So, moving forward, what can we think about for the future, and what um, what makes me feel hopeful for the relationship? 
you know, what I'm hopeful for is, is that currently the, the current generation of learners don't carry the same um, kind of history around with them. I would say that across the board, I find learners to be very, they've, they've grown up at a time when assisted dying is, has been their reality. And so there isn't the same kinds of historical um, weight that uh, that they're needing to sort through. So there's just a curiosity. So I'm, I'm very hopeful of, because of the current generation of the learners. What I would say um, and how we move forward is, is how and where to focus our sustainability efforts. I'm really concerned about um, the uh, made assessors and providers community because who it seems to be made up um, of are really deeply committed um, individuals who, um, um, you know, might not be around for the amount of time that we need them for to address advance requests if requests are going to be many years in, in, in the making. But I think it would do us well as a, as a group of assessors and providers to think carefully about sustainability efforts and really to think about um, partnering with academic institutions to focus on um, the current learners and, and leveraging the generational differences that I think exist, but also thinking about our relationships with family medicine in um, in other uh, the European countries that have assisted dying um, you know the vast majority of procedures are completed by people's families physi family physicians and I really think that there's a, an appetite um, for for even sort of housing and ownership to exist within family medicine so I these are the things that give me hope for the relationship and and I hope that as a uh, community, we can um, be thoughtful about how we approach um, uh, both uh, sustainability and supporting learners coming forward. And so I'll end with um, just this last uh, piece of advocacy and and um, a reminder that, you know, my task today was to challenge you, was to wear my palliative care hat and challenge you to um, consider the perspective of palliative care as we think about the relationship um, between um, our areas of focus, the areas of focus. I live in both worlds and um, I uh, wouldn't have it any other way, but I do for, for my palliative care colleagues do long for the time when uh, when we are needed because um, the Canada's public says so. Canada's public um, has has been very clear that made is a need, but uh, the same public um, doesn't actually understand what palliative care is yet and so uh, can't express the same kind of need. So I would say uh, I look forward to the day when, when we achieve that. So I'll end there and very happy to um, take any questions or um, comments. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was an excellent presentation. And really, I know I can really see the compassion that you have in your role, you know, as both palliative care and maid. And thank you for sharing your journey and the stories that you shared as well of the patients that made an impact on your life and how you carried through with your, again, your role with maid and palliative care. And yeah, so we're just so thankful to have you and giving you this opportunity to, to share the speech that I know is um, slated for the, the, the conference. So thank you. Uh, we do have quite a few um, questions from the audience. So happy to go through those. So the first one, uh, just because a lot of our members here, um, of course, are in support of MAID and is something that they would want to consider. Um, can you please address how to go about switching from palliative care to signing up for MAID and the timeline involved. So for someone, you know, who's in palliative care, I know it can be very case by case, but what advice would you give or guidance to someone who would be considering MAID? Yeah, it, it saddens me that that's a question, right? That we have to figure out how to, um, to access MAID um, if you are in a palliative, if you are being cared for by a palliative care clinician. That to me is, is an uh, an interesting question to start with, um, but from a very practical place, what I would I would say to to um, the the questioner uh, is speak to your palliative care clinician if it's a physician or nurse practitioner who is in most responsible for for your care because we do have regardless of our personal professional um, uh, or, or institutional. Um, uh, 
uh, sort of regulations around that, we have a duty to ensure that people do have um, access to to MAID and effectively refer people. And so the mo the the most efficient thing I would say is just directly um, uh, come out very directly and say I'd like to. Um, get more information, proceed with, uh, made whatever um, the, the phrase is that the person's comfortable with, but they have a, we have a duty to ensure effective referrals. Great, perfect, thank you. Um, another question that we have is, uh, is palliative care available for people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, I would say, I would take a step back and I would say palliative care is available to, should be available to any person is, let me say this, palliative care is necessary for every person who has a serious illness from the time of diagnosis of serious illness. And by serious illness, I mean something that's incurable and progressive and dementia certainly is an example of that. There isn't a time at which any person with any serious illness, when palliative care, when there's a switch and all of a sudden palliative care becomes appropriate. Certainly, if somebody has complex symptoms or co a complexity that requires expertise in palliative care, but when you think about dementia, because we don't have medications to reverse it or, or to, to, to cure it, the care actually is palliative, right? Like the care is not um, all the care that a person receives is palliative care. We just don't call it that. So, so you know, what I would say is that from the time, from the moment of diagnosis, palliative care is necessary for the person. When is palliative care specialist, a person who specializes in palliative care, when is that necessary? It's necessary if the complexity of a person's problems warrant that level of, of expertise and, and specialty, because really, you know, the, it's the it's the neurologists, psychiatrists, family physicians, the team, the dementia teams that are providing the care 24 seven, they're really are providing wonderful palliative care um, as it is. So that's what I'd say to that. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have, and you may have mentioned, you know, you talked about this a little bit. Um, if someone is diagnosed with dementia, al dementia or Alzheimer's, can they ask for MAID and specify conditions when it can be administered? I know you did touch on um, yeah. this request. Um, would, it, would you be able to uh, provide a, the difference between the waiver of final consent and when it can be used and how it's different from an advanced request? Yeah, and I didn't do um, a good enough job at, at sort of simplifying that because uh, it was for for time uh, reasons that I needed to. But you know what? Um, you know the the difference between a waiver and advance request. Um, a waiver is uh, what is available to a person who has made a decision, who has set a date to proceed with with made, and and is wanting reassurance that they can still have the made on that specific date even if they've lost capacity. So, you know, what it was intended to replace was the original 10 day waiting period that we needed to have in, in Canada when the first round of legislation came, you could sign the consent and then you had to wait 10 days. If you lost capacity over that 10 days, you couldn't have made. And so in the second iteration of the legislation, they removed that 10 day clause and put in the, the ability to, um, to sign a waiver that would give consent to the, to the physician or the nurse practitioner. An advanced request is, is what somebody would complete, they would sort of with their physician or, or nurse practitioner, outline the conditions under which they would want assisted dying to proceed. Um, well in advance of actually reaching that place, whether or not they've been diagnosed with dementia or diagnosed with any sort of illness. Um, it is about, these are the conditions under which I would not consider life to be tolerable. And I would want my life, I would consider my life to be over and I would want made to proceed. Those are, that's what an advance request actually is. Currently, advance requests are not um, part of uh, assisted dying legislation. So a person cannot um, complete an advance request or, or make an advance request. Um, and so, but, but that's likely that there are conversations about that. And it's likely that, that, that will be moved towards that in Canada, like it has for some of the other countries. And there, it's just a really tricky, tricky, um, particularly tricky um, area of assisted dying that I think at a policy level, we need, there needs to be much more conversation about. Great. Um, 
Absolutely. And we look forward to, you know, having more conversation about that, you know, as it's being looked at right now. So we hope to, you know, know more and see what direction advanced requests are, are taking. Um, another question that we have is most palliative care programs include eligibility criteria of estimated three months life expectancy, making most track two made patients ineligible for the benefits or services. Can you see this changing? Uh, that's a great question. So I'm, I'm glad that I sort of spent the time kind of uh, looking at the four different care settings for, for palliative care. Um, because the, 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 the sort of criteria of less than three months, which is, if I can just pause for a second and say that, that clinicians are horribly inaccurate when it comes to estimating, um, you know, the, the duration of somebody's survival. And so, you know, we are only sort of accurate when a person ends up living less than a week or more than a year, anything in between we're horribly inaccurate. So this idea of three months is really frustrating because it's it's not something that we could actually accurately predict. Having said that, for a palliative care unit, there needs to be some kind of um, uh, guidance for for who we we're caring for. And in palliative care units, they and hospices, they tend to care for people in the last days or weeks of their life. And so the 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 criteria, quote unquote, of less than three months is is what's been put on um, for most palliative care units and for, for hospice patients. And so the, you know, the access to palliative care in the clinic setting, in the hospital setting, in the, um, uh, in the, I'm liking clinic, hospital. What was my fourth one? <laughs> I'm acute? completely blank. No, okay, uh, hospital, acute care, and then at home. Um, there aren't the same kind of sorry about that. There aren't the same kind of of, of strict criteria, and it and it's because it has to do with sort of um, the beds and the funding model. So to answer the question, um, you, you know, there's it's only a, a sort of a, a narrow group of of individuals for whom this kind of criteria applies, and and um, and it's not actually um, an enforceable criteria. And so the the folks that that I would say that we were as a system, we're pretty good at the people who have palliative care accessible to them, access it in at the right time. I worry about people who don't have accessible uh, palliative care accessible to them. Thank you. Uh, another question that we have is, uh, if advanced care directives don't improve end of life conditions, do they perhaps give the individual a higher level of psychological comfort? And what can be done to improve the effectiveness of advanced care plans? Uh, another great question. So what I did not sort of get into the details is actually what happens to caregivers who are trying to enact uh, advanced directives. We're no longer able to use anxiety or depression scales to measure the impact of having to make decisions based on advanced directives. We actually need to use trauma scales. And so the, the, the psychological um, reassurances have to be balanced with the psychological damage that we're actually causing right to, to substitute decision makers. And what I would say is that um, the focus for for any sort of advanced care planning must be on uh, a, a much greater sense of what, what we're talking about with advanced requests. What's the image of life that is not tolerable, right? What are the things that you need to be able to do in order for you to feel like you're contributing in a meaningful way that you're being yourself. That's the information that's actually going to be helpful to a substitute decision maker, because that information can be applied to many different kinds of decisions, and it doesn't require a clinical context. So it's not helpful to know whether or not my partner wants dialysis. What's helpful to know is that the image of life around dialysis and what, and, and what that would look like, that's what's not acceptable. Um, it's not so much the dialysis itself. And so it's taking treatments out of advanced care planning and making it more about the person and what they value. That's, that's an excellent point. And that's what we always you know, encourage with folks who are asking about advanced care planning, having those conversations with that substitute decision maker. So it's, yeah, important conversations to have. Thank you. Uh, um, another question that we have is, it is significant that in Belgium, palliative care became available to everyone at the same time as made. 
Why is it significant for us? Is palliative care not available to everyone in Canada? Short answer is no, it's not. Um, it's, it was not, it's not part of the, um, it's not legislated uh, that it be accessible. And, and there are actually a couple of countries when they did put their assisted dying legislation came through, it was at the same time as legislating access to palliative care. And that is one of the challenges I think that's actually made the, has been, has been made the relationship between uh, made and palliative care particularly contentious. I would say in particular geographically, um, folks in that are not in urban settings are much, much less likely to have access to palliative care. I will say that the pandemic was helpful in that um, in that virtual palliative care is now a thing where I, I don't think that it was uh, much before 2020. So I do think it's better, but there is something to be said for mandating access to palliative care. Um, it's just that that the way that we're we were organized and have uh, have ourselves organized in Canada, it's not what happened. Um, another uh, comment and question is, okay. uh, thank you for your deeply considered presentation. As a healthcare navigator with a lot of cancer patients, I have found an absolute and complete lack of referrals by oncologists to palliative care. Have you found a script for patients or families on how to bring up this sensitive topic? Uh, again, it's a great question. And um... Wonderful, wonderful uh, participants <laughs> we've got here, Melissa. These are really thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. I will say that it, it does feel different, um, the relationship between palliative care and oncology and the relationship between palliative care and many of the, of the specialties that we work with and, and, and of course, family medicine. Um, I, I think it, it is very challenging to advocate for yourself um, around palliative care and, and, and advocate for others in an advocation role. And what I would say is to just be direct. I think that that if I can if I can sort of take my physician hat off for a moment, I think phys physicians are tricky to communicate about any any end of life issue. And if we're just very direct with them and say, I would like to be referred to palliative care, or this person would you know needs a referral to palliative care, one of the maybe one of the strategies is. Um, is to say because we need to give we need to ensure that the caregiver has support because that's an in, inarguable right and we can so you know one of the ways to kind of sway um, a uh, a specialist colleague or or a physician who might be reluctant to refer a patient is is to sort of then focus on the caregiver support that palliative care can provide and that might be um, sort of a, a strategy. For, for how you can ensure palliative care would be involved. I just kind of made that one up right now. It occurred to me, but uh, but it makes sense that it might actually bypass the personal sense of failure that a, that a, a physician might be preventing a physician from involving palliative care. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for just one more question and then we're going to wrap up for the afternoon. Uh, and this one goes back, you did touch on this during your presentation in regards to palliative sedation. And the question mm. is, do all palliative care physicians give palliative sedation if the patient wants it? So it tends not to be the thing that a person wants. And, and the reason for that is that when you've got a relentlessly poorly controlled symptom, you're not really thinking about, um, a, 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 about something like palliative sedation. You're just trying to get through the moment. And so every um, trained uh, palliative care clinician will, will have um, palliative sedation as a symptom management strategy that they should be comfortable utilizing. The frequency with which palliative, care, palliative sedation was used earlier in my career, it was just exponentially less than it is now. And I think that's sort of it, that's a different topic than what the than what the question is getting at. But but it's not so much what a person would want; it's what a person actually would need to manage the symptoms. Now, it was always really really interesting in this going to conferences in the states back in the 1990s when palliative sedation was a topic because if existential suffering is the actual symptom, then you know how can we say that it's that it's intractable and irremediable? And, and really, in large part, that's what assisted, that's who assisted dying is particularly um, utilized is by those that have existential suffering. And so for that population, I would say, you know, the word want makes a bit more sense in that if uh, a person would want for, um, 
for their suffering to be ended, then, then assisted dying is their option. For a person who would want uh, to have their suffering ended, um, palliative sedation would, would be an option as well uh, under the care of a palliative care clinician. Thank you. I actually have one more question. I think this is a good one to end off with. Um, sure. Just talking about, you know, the direction of palliative care and me. So this person asked, of, cur of current palliative care doctors, are they moving to be more accepting of MAID or is the either or attitude? I don't know that I would characterize it as an either or attitude. Having said that, I understand the, you know, the, 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 the premise of the question. I think that, that there is a firm commitment to, um, to the historical principles of palliative care. And I also know that there are many palliative care clinicians who are also made providers and assessors. How that is evolving amongst the palliative care community, I will have this same but reverse um, conversation with my palliative care colleagues and, 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 and get back to you. I don't know. I don't know if there's been a, um, how it's evolved in the minds of, of our palliative care leaders in Canada. Um, deeply in their minds. I don't know how it's evolved. I'm grateful for their advocacy because, um, you know, it has been effective at a, at a very difficult time. But I'm also hopeful that that um, that spaces for dialogue and um, and honest conversations can can really ensure that our patients and their families, people are kept at the center of all of this, because um, that really is is what any of us got into this work uh, for originally in the first place. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. That's great. Thank you so much. And I want to um, just share a few um, comments from the audience that um, really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you so much for such an honest speaker presentation. This has been a challenging area to navigate in my work experience. Uh, we have another thank you for your deeply considered presentation. Thank you for sharing all your expert and expertise or experience and expertise, sorry, a very informative and interesting webinar. So everyone here is so happy to have been able to listen to your presentation. We had so many great questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of them, but yeah, we're just so uh, grateful for the, the engagement that we had with our, our viewers. And our next webinar for those um, who are interested, we have a final webinar taking place for 2022, and that will be on Wednesday, December 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And we will be joined by Dying with Dignity Canada's CEO, Helen Long, and Dr. Ford Gubit, a MAID provider from Atlantic Canada. And they will be discussing MAID and what you should know going into 2023. So again, that is on December 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So you can sign up for that. Registration is still open. So we welcome you to that, or that webinar as well. And again, thank you, Jeff. So much for your time this afternoon and hope that uh, you enjoy the rest of your day and for everyone who's also watching thank you for uh, being with us this afternoon and everyone take care many thanks take care